Thank you so very much. Uh, this is just kind of an open, I, I like to do this before most of my messages where I just ask the kids to interact a little bit with a, a question to open the message. Um, and so this is kind of an open-ended one. I just want to hear young people respond to the question, what, what makes God happy? It's, it's kind of a fun question, I think. Um, one that uh, may have lots of answers, different answers, but just to any of the young people here, what is your, uh, what's your response to that question? What, what makes God happy? So I, I need some bold young people. I'm going to start calling on some of you. If, uh, if you're not cheating, Sebastian, I'll, I'll call on you. But if you're cheating, I, you're out of here, buddy. Bless his heart. <laughs> Go ahead, Sebastian. Unity. Oh, unity. That's deep. That's, that's deep. I, I might have to call... Uh, a flag on that one, though, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, who do we got here? Isaiah? Us. Us! We make God happy. Ah, that's pretty good, huh? Very good. Come on now. Anyone else? Yeah, help me out over here. What do we got? Oh, we got Adon? Let's hear it, Adon. Praying, being good. Praying and being good. You like that? None of you adults thought of that, did you? Let's hear a couple more. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not going to be able to know from this distance. I'm going to go with uh, Joseph. Is that right? We might as well close the service right now. Joseph, what makes God happy? In the mic. Oh. I, I didn't. Brendan, did you get that In the mic. That's deep. I don't know if that's going to take us down to a level. I'm not ready to go to quite yet. That's bold, though. Um, uh, Toby, we got uh, it's a Benjamin down there, I think. What makes God happy, right? Kindness. Kindness, yes. Yes. Sometimes we get caught up thinking about what makes God sad, but it's good to think. What? Anyone else? One more, maybe? There are young people on this side, but they're quieter. They're more reflective. They're taking this all in. One more? All right, Elizabeth. Being happy. Being happy. These are great answers. I'm going to throw a few up here. Uh, oh, I don't know how that got up there, but uh, I'm sure that makes God very happy when the Seahawks win. Yes, that's fun. Okay, obviously, uh, you know, obeying, but uh, uh, I, I put the qualifier of loving obedience because just obedience on its own can kind of sound, you know, authoritative, kind of militant, uh, maybe even coercive. But th- 3 John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And, and that comes from the heart of God. I have no greater joy than to know uh, that you are following the things that are going to ultimately bring you happiness. And it's a very simple thing. If sin makes God unhappy, which I think we would say that's correct, sin does not make God happy, then not sinning would probably make him happy. Ben, see, this is, we, we can understand this, right? So um, uh, the Bible says that uh, sin is breaking the law, sin is a transgression of the law. Paul said, I wouldn't have known sin except for the law had taught me that you shall not do these things. So when we obey the Lord out of a heart of love, uh, I think we can agree that brings him happiness. But not only following God's law and obeying and doing the things that he asks us to do, in the story of the three missing things in, in Luke chapter 15, there's the lost lamb, there's a lost coin, and then you have the lost son or sons. You might say in the story of the prodigal son, both sons in their own way were struggling with, uh, with sin. Jesus makes the statement, especially with the first two, the lost sheep and the lost coin, that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who have no need of repentance. And this is a very significant statement that Jesus is making to the culture and the time that they didn't think a a, a sinner could ever please God. But Jesus says when someone repents, when they're saved, when they're redeemed, when they're forgiven, that there's more rejoicing about that one one moment in time than than 99 who have not uh, ever strayed and needed to do that. So obviously, salvation, repentance brings God great joy. Uh, Faith 
And, and faith can mean a lot of things. We can spend a lot of time talking about faith. But I like this passage here in Hebrews. It's about Enoch that says, By faith Enoch walked with God and then was taken and was seen no more. For he had obtained a witness that he had become pleasing to God. And then the next verse says, For without faith it is impossible to please God. So our faith, and again, that can mean a lot of things. It can be uh, superficial. It can be deep. It can be wide. But basically having a loving relationship, trusting the Lord brings him faith, as we would say any child. And then Sebastian nailed it right from the beginning. I know it just came from a heart of purity, a heart of knowledge, identifying that unity uh, also brings God uh, joy. Uh, Paul here says in Philippians, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, just as he's facing the cross, he prays for unity among his people. That is what brought him comfort at that terrible time, is knowing that his, uh, his followers would uh, unite in their faith. Next question. Is, is it different or is it the same? But it is, it's the same. But it's all, it is kind of different too, isn't it? I mean, Jesus was God, but when you think about, you know, what makes God, you think of God as that great, invisible, ethereal power that speaks through thunder clouds and lightning and, and you know, and all that. But Jesus became a man, and, and so it does change the question a little bit. So again, just to the young people, think about Jesus and all your stories, your Sabbath school stories, school Bible class. What made Jesus happy? I'd like to hear some young people answer that. What made Jesus happy? Did I put you to sleep already? I, I don't know. Vitor, I see you over there. Don. Where's all the Osenia clan? Come on. What made Jesus? Think about Jesus. Oh, I see someone in the back corner here. Thank you, Owen. Going to get some help back here. <clears throat> when sinners come back to God. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, when sinners come back to God, that, that made Jesus happy. Adon? When people followed Jesus. When people followed him, sure. Can you think of any stories where Jesus was happy? You, by the way, this is not always the easy thing. Now, Jesus was on a mission, a mission, a very important mission of salvation. And at times, he was, we may even picture him as being more serious. He's battling a lot. He's battling with the devil. He's battling with the Pharisees. Sometimes he's battling with his disciples. And Isaiah says he is a man of sorrow, acquainted with griefs. So you don't hear a lot of Bible verses about Jesus giggling and Jesus laughing and Jesus smiling. But we know he experienced joy. All right. Serving others. Serving others. Let's have one or two more from our very educated, elevated children here today. All right, Sebastian. Proclaiming the gospel. Wow. This young man has such a deep understanding of spiritual things. One more, or are we all done? All right. Thank you guys for indulging. Here's a few that I put up here. Did you know children made Jesus happy? He seemed to really uh, be drawn to and change the conversation and the dynamic uh, when it came to interacting with children. Blessing others, I heard several statements along that line. Jesus loved to bless others. The love of the Father seemed to sustain and give Jesus strength and courage. He was often going away from the crowd to pray, to spend time uh, uh, with the Father, and so understanding his love and connection with the Father, proclaiming the gospel, as Sebastian so eloquently told us, and then also the hope of salvation. Hebrews says it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Before the joy set before him, the hope of salvation. Now, we could answer these in different ways, more specific ways, uh, other ways, but I thought it would be a good opening to this uh, the message that I'm going to share, and really what the next series of messages that we're going to have together uh, uh, over the next several weeks regarding how we make God happy and what God does for us. But, oh, by the way, boys, uh, thank you. That's, uh, uh, that's the end of the quiz. Jesus says in John 13, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And blessed in the, in the Bible is not really different from the word we would use as far as happiness. You know, the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are they, you know. It all means happy, happy. If you know these things, you are happy 
if you do them. And it only makes sense that as we seek to do the things that please the Lord, they should also make us happy. They should also please us. I'm going to change directions here for just a moment and uh, talk a little bit about another topic. What's the greatest power in the universe? There is a power in this universe greater than any other force imaginable. It is the most powerful force in the universe, greater than the physics of a nuclear fusion, gravity, a supernova or galactic singularity, or even infinity stones. It traverses space and time, superseding thought and consciousness. It does what no other power in nature or the material world can do. Scientists cannot explain it. AI cannot compute it. Philosophers cannot deduce it. It lives in the realm of poets and preachers, dreamers, and storytellers. It is the basis of our existence and reality, though we rarely see it and often avoid it. And we frequently fail to realize that we cannot live without it. Every relationship needs it. Every decision depends upon it. It is the foundation of grace. It is the definition of mercy. And it is the ultimate manifestation of love. It is the basis of the plan of salvation. It is the good news of the gospel. It is the message of all Scripture, and it is the purpose of the cross. It confounds demons and angers the devil, but in its presence, holy angels bow, and the glorious seraphim cover their feet. They cover their feet. I think it's an interesting juxtaposition. If you remember the vision of Isaiah when he sees the temple and he sees the seraphim flying and they're covering their face and they're covering their feet. Now I want you to think about John 13 when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He washed their feet. Angels in heaven shield their feet from the face of God, but Jesus in his condescension washed his disciples' feet. Think on that for a while, Ben. We're going to talk more about that. You share with me the depth of revelation that brings to you. Every great story of, in human history includes this power of which I speak and to some degree illustrates it. It's what Oskar Schindler tried to explain to Herr Goethe at the Platzow concentration camp in southern Poland, if you've ever seen Schindler's List. It's what Balthazar tried to teach Judah in Lew Wallace's epic of Ben-Hur. Lacking it is what destroyed Captain Ahab in Moby Dick. It's what destroyed Javert in Les Miserables and the Prince of Denmark in Shakespeare's tragedy Hamlet. But it's what saved Anakin Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> It is the moral of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol and the conclusion of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Whether War and Peace, Crime and Punishment, Gilgamesh, all the great stories of history revolve around, depend upon, illustrate, or teach this great power. Shall we pray and dismiss? I could go on and on and on. What is this great power that we are talking about today? It is not PowerPoint, I'll tell you that much. Holding you in suspense. This was designed in, in the service. It's forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness is the greatest power in the universe. Robert Frost said that to be social is to be forgiving. If we were to cut off from our lives everyone who offended us, in no time we would be isolated and alone. To be social is to be forgiving. I like that from Robert Frost. Martin Luther King Jr., we must develop and maintain the capacity for, to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. Now, we could say that love, you know, love is, you know, the great power, right? Love is a definition of God. Love is the, you know, foundation of the law. But what is love without forgiveness? Is it really love? Love 
surrounds itself with the humble power of forgiveness. Uh, Fred Rogers said, forgiveness is a strange thing. It can sometimes be easier to forgive our enemies than our friends. Think about that. It can be hardest of all to forgive people we love, right? You know, you expect your enemies to fail you, right? You expect your enemies to offend you. And so when they do, but then it comes to a point where you need to forgive, well, I I forgive you because that's what I expected. You don't expect your friends and loved ones to hurt you, but they do, don't they? Because we're all imperfect. And so forgiveness can be even more difficult. I like what Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Gandhi, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Nelson Mandela, as I walked out of the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Mandela was kept as a political prisoner in South Africa for 27 years. You can imagine there would be a little bitterness. But he said, I knew I would never get out of that prison unless I released myself from that bitterness. An 18th century German writer, Jean Paul, said, Humanity is never so beautiful as when praying for forgiveness or else forgiving another. Humanity is never so beautiful as when praying for forgiveness or else forgiving another. Again, uh, so many beautiful ways of characterizing or, or, or sharing what the, the importance or blessing or beauty or strength or greatness of forgiveness is. Forgiveness is what separates us from the world. It's what separates the righteous from the unrighteous, the, the believer from the unbeliever understanding the depth and power of forgiveness. You know, we in the church, we use the, I, the idea or the concept of forgiveness so often, it can kind of be uh, uh, almost uh, uh, something we take for granted. We often just keep it at a very superficial level. Oh, it means you, you feel bad, you say you're sorry, it means restoring a debt or something like that. And so we keep it at this very, you know, kind of simplistic level. And while there's still things to be learned at that level, to the same degree we make, super, uh, we make forgiveness superficial, to the same degree do we make sin superficial. But the more we delve into the depths of the meaning and the power of what forgiveness really is, not only do we see sin for what it really is, but we get to see God for who He really is. And so for over the next few weeks, if you are are willing to join with me in the journey, we have uh, other things that happen between now and then, but I'm going to be devoting a lot of my time and energy and, and, and presentation to exploring the basis and principles and stories, the great stories of the Bible to help us understand better what is forgiveness. Wouldn't our world be a better place if there was more forgiveness, friends? Wouldn't our world, wouldn't our society, wouldn't our government, wouldn't our business, wouldn't our church, wouldn't our lives, our families, our marriages, our relationships, wouldn't that all improve significantly if we embrace the character of God that illustrates the power of forgiveness? I think it is a a topic and a theme that uh, is well worth our time. I want to illustrate this to you and and how this power is so overwhelming. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. And and not only our forgiveness, a lot of times you think, oh yes, Jesus died on the cross. He died so that we could be forgiven. That's great. But not only is our forgiveness of all sins, of all offense, depended upon the shed blood of Jesus, but our ability to forgive others also depends upon the life and blood of Jesus Christ. It is not just your own merits that flow into your life when you decide, oh, that person offended me, but I'm such a good person, I'm going to go ahead and forgive them. It is because of your own acceptance of forgiveness. It's because of the own transformation that has come into your heart that you're able to understand the power and depth of forgiveness and then offer it to someone else. Even when you forgive someone else, it's because of the mercies of Jesus Christ. Hebrews, or not Hebrews, Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it says it's by the kindness of Christ that we are led to repentance. Even repentance itself begins with Jesus Christ drawing us. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So any forgiveness at any level, as trite, as simple as it may be, still depends on the marvelous mystery and power of God that flows from His sacrifice on our behalf on Calvary. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. It is by the blood, by reason of the life that makes atonement. When Jesus shed His blood, it wasn't just that He died, it's that He gives us His life. So forgiveness depends upon the blood of Christ, by which is the life of Christ, by which is the power of God poured into your life. Is there any greater power in the universe than the power of God? And He offers us that power through the process of forgiveness. We tap into the divine nature. We are transformed and redeemed through the power of forgiveness. We are changed by it. It is biblically, spiritually, the greatest thing that we can interact with in our lives. Forgiveness. Paul says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive. This is part of the the, the miracle of redemption, right? That that sin is like death. Sin is like a, a slavery. Sin holds us in a place where we cannot be successful. We cannot thrive. But Paul says, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions. Forgiveness has the ability to resurrect that which is dead. I like the story, uh, I I used it earlier in the kids' quiz of, of the missing things, right? The missing sheep, the missing coin. If you remember the end of the story of the prodigal son, when the older son is upset, right? The prodigal son comes home. The father is excited. They have a feast. And the older son hears the party. He says, what are you doing? And he's told, oh, your brother has come back. And they're throwing a party. He goes to his father and he says, what are you doing? The father says to the older son, he says these words. He said, he said son, we had to celebrate. Have you ever noticed that? He says those words. He said, we had to celebrate. We had to rejoice. Because your brother who was dead has now been made alive. Your brother who was lost has now been found. So we had to celebrate. We had to do it. This is the power of forgiveness. It creates life where there was death. It creates power where there was nothing. It restores that which is lost. Even death itself is reversed. The sermon title comes here from Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God. And I love this part. He will not just pardon, he will abundantly pardon. You like that word? You know, part of what the, the wreck of the human psyche that sin has done in our minds is it has reduced and made us resistant to not only receiving forgiveness, but offering forgiveness. We resist receiving forgiveness because it means you have to want to be forgiven, which means you have to admit you're at fault. So sin says you haven't done anything wrong. Yeah, you can enjoy having that relationship with God, but don't admit anything. That's what sin does to us. But the Bible says that he will abundantly pardon, and, and uh, forgive me for using my children for so many illustrations, but you, many of you have children, and you know what it's like. When, when your kids, did any of you have kids that ever fought? No, no, none of your kids ever fought? My, only mine did? Oh, okay, a few, few others. Well, from time to time, the kids will fight, right? And so as parents, oh, oh yeah, I see some over here. Thank you, sister. I got a witness. Oh, more. Oh, all of a sudden, the floodgates are opening. <laughs> no. So, so the, the kids are fighting, and you bring them together, and, and they're, they're fighting, but you're going to make them apologize, right? That's what parents do. You, you make the kids. They don't want to apologize, but you say, no, no, you, you got to bring some redemption. Now, okay, now say you're sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry. And then you go, for what? <sighs> for, for calling you a bad name. And, uh, and I won't do it again. And, uh, will you forgive me? 
Any of you ever seen that before? Okay, we got it recorded if you want to watch it later. The idea is our human nature wants us to do the least necessary for forgiveness. What's the least I can do? Okay, you caught me. You caught me in the act. I, I'll, I will repent, I will, but I'm going to do the least that is necessary. I'll say the words. That's enough. I'm sorry. Oh, now I got to admit what it was for. Oh, now I got to ask. Uh, that's what sin does to us. Our natural inclination is to say, what's the least I need to do in order to get out of this trap that I'm in? Any of you ever get a speeding ticket? No one here? You guys, my goodness. Okay, right? The first question is, what's the least I can do to get out of this? Right? That's the righteous thing to do. We always want to figure out what's the least. But the Bible says when it comes to, and we take that same attitude to God, by the way. We're afraid sometimes to come to God with our sins, with our guilt, with our issues, because we think He thinks like us. And we think, oh, he'll probably be mad at me. He's probably going to offer me maybe some sense of reconciliation, but it's going to be minor. It's going to be the least. But the Bible says, no, don't think that way. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways are not like our ways. He will abundantly, lavishly pour on your heart and soul at the forgiveness that you so desperately need. He loves to do it. He can't wait to do it. He is that father that waits at the gate looking for that son, waiting for him to return, looking on the horizon, waiting, is that him? Is that him? Is that her? Will they come back? And rejoices when he's able to offer that forgiveness and welcome them back into the home. He will abundantly pardon. Don't miss that concept. Don't miss that word. It is not the natural way when it comes to the fallen mind. This is another one of my favorites that I love. This is the very end of the book of Micah, the last few verses. Micah asks the question, who is a God like you? Who, who, who is like you? I look at all the other gods of the world. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity, passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever. And then this last part, because he, what's the word there? He delights in unchanging love. Some of your Bibles say mercy. The King James, New King James. He delights in mercy. But it is the word. It's the same word as agape love in the, in the New Testament. It's the Old Testament equivalent of that. He delights. He, he is empowered. He is enthrilled. It makes him happy to forgive you. And again, it's so different from, from what happens in, in the normal fallen way of our minds. We will sometimes be forced to forgive or we might reluctantly forgive, but it never, you know, again, when we're just looking at it from our selfish ways, we, we don't want to forgive. We don't want to let go. We want to be like Mark in his pie uh, illustration. You know, we want that bigger part. Of, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give that piece of pie, but we don't want to do that. But the Bible says that God delights it is his joy to offer redemption, to offer forgiveness. So many different ways of illustrating uh, uh, God's depth of forgiveness, God's willingness to separate us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. This is the very next verse in Micah. He will again, and I know I, I like that word again. <laughs> Because as much as he gave me mercy and forgiveness yesterday and last week, did you know I need it again today? I need it again today. I have not yet arrived. I know you think that Pastor Dave, woo, that guy is spiritual. I know you think that. But ask my wife, ask my children. I need his grace. I need his forgiveness. I need his mercy again. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, and notice he changes from the third person to the first person. Again, it's the third. He will, and then it says, yes, you, speaking to the Lord, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now, uh, again, I'm just kind of whetting your appetite and, and trying to let you know where we're going over the next few weeks uh, of sermons as we, we get into this development of forgiveness. But I want to close today's service with uh, a story. And now forgive me, I know many of you have heard this story. It's one of the great stories of forgiveness in, in history over the last uh, hundred years or so. 
but um, I just think it's so appropriate to see forgiveness in action. How many of you have read The Hiding Place? Oh, if you haven't, you just got to read it, or if it hasn't been a long time. Corey Ten Boom, she's living in Holland during World War II, and she and her family decide to hide Jews in their home to save them from the concentration camps, okay? That's the hiding place. She gets discovered, and she and her sister go to a concentration camp. Her father dies, and her sister dies also in a concentration camp, okay? But she shares this story. That's kind of the background. It was in a church in Munich. This is Corey Tim Boom's words, okay? It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were, people were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, just two years from the end of the war, two years. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to a defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture, this one right here. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There was never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence they collected their wraps, and in silence they left the room. And that's when I saw him. Working his way forward against the others, one moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next the blue uniform, the visored cap with the skull and the crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at the Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Walk in her shoes just for a minute. Can you imagine? Now he was in front of me. Hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. That's the, like, whip crop. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me, clearly. But, he continued, since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips. Fräulein, again the hand was held out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that I stood there, hand held, that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I ever had to do for I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. 
Those, those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. As I stood there, and, I, 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 and still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And she's forever remembered for that statement. Corey Tim Boom. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being and brought tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with all my heart. She called him brother. Any of you who are fans of Victor Hugo, it was when Bishop Digny called Jean Valjean brother that it changed his life and taught him about the redemption of God. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands the former guard, and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. The power of God through the ministry and reality of forgiveness. When was the last time you felt God's forgiveness? When was the last time the power of His forgiveness transformed your life that you were able to offer it to someone else who needs your forgiveness? It makes all the difference. If you want to feel the love of God intensely in your life, you must open your heart to forgiveness. Forgiveness does not deal away with consequences. We're going to get into these things in later weeks. It doesn't mean that that guard shouldn't have paid for consequences for his actions. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were forgiven. They were still kicked out of the garden. When David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan tells him, your sin has been removed, but there are still consequences. So we need not rush to one ditch or the other when it comes to false ideas of forgiveness. We need to stay right in the heart of the gospel. Will you join me in this journey in the next couple weeks? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are so privileged to be able to explore this together and to renew in our hearts and minds a very basic but powerful Christian principle Sometimes we, 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 we look at it in a very superficial, glib way, Father, but in the times in which we live where it just seems that so much bitterness controls our world and it seeps into our very being and our bones, it, it is appropriate, I feel, that we delve deeper into this powerful, wonderful principle of forgiveness. You've given us a wealth of information through the stories of the Bible, through the ministry of Jesus through the encouragement of the Word. May this be a refreshing and empowering time in our lives. And God, thank you that we were able to be here today, to be in your presence, and to be reminded of your great sacrifice on our behalf, by which we have the promise of forgiveness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I am, uh, again, so delighted that you have been part of our worship service today. Uh, Look forward to seeing you again uh, as we move forward. We've got VBS coming up next week. That is going to be a lot of fun, and we'll continue to worship together.
Happy Sabbath.